Well, that's, uh, no, it's fine. Okay, great. Let me, let me, uh, the, all right. Thank you very much. Bueno, yo he visto algunas que sí, otras que no. La, la, la verdad que eso, pero sí la vi. Lo he visto gente. ¿Tú tienes agua aquí? No, pero tampoco pasa nada. Bueno, pero te puedo coger un vaso si quieres. Ah, no. Eso sería bien diferente. Pues ya. Yo tengo aquí mi botellita. Ya fue ya. Yo, yo. Y si se ha the same feeling as if I were in a karaoke or something. <coughs> Do you, want, do you have any favorite sing, song? Sing, sing. Do you have any favorite song? <laughs> <laughs> what was? The eye of the tiger. The eye of the tiger. The eye of the tiger. No, I don't know. Sorry. It, it, it is not in my, on my, on my catalog. <laughs> Bueno, tú tienes, ah, el, tú el, tienes, el, el, tú tienes el, el, el ratón por si acaso también. Pero mira, eso no funciona. Eso no... No, no, esto no. Lo que funciona es el, el, el puntito rojo. Es una parte de esta de aquí. Sí, pero eso de cambiar los slides... No, pero eso no, no funciona. Bueno, entonces no. Yo creo que sí. Pero no para ti. <risa> No tuviese el tiempo ahí arriba, ¿no? Sí. Vale. No te dejes tiempo. Preguntas, se envían alguna ahí por preguntas. Creo que eso te pasará tu micrófono. Sí. Si hacen alguna, sí. Sí, sí, sí. las ordenan por productos, se ordenan sí, por, sí, por blanks. Por blanks. Por blanks. Y si no, pues. Eh. ¿Quieres que diga yo algo? ¿O José Luis y digo yo el micrófono y todo eso? ¿O lo dejas tú? No, como lo hemos hecho antes. Si quieres, como lo hemos hecho antes. Como he hecho antes.
Ah, bueno. Eso será dentro de un par de años. A mí me gusta hacerlas, no está bien. Hi. Uh, so far we're fine, thank you so much. Uh, I think lots of people are still coming because we have six in the auditorium and second class. So yeah, no worries, we, we have time. You just let, let us know when it's a good time to start. Um, I think it's some minutes we'll still be here. All right, five minutes or something. I came straight here with no six pockets. All right, yes, makes sense, <laughs> thanks. Yo que estuve hasta por Esta está en flash de lo que hacía la luz. Es la de antes de la cabeza. Ah, entonces digo, aquí, aquí. <risa> que parece que rate quita. So. We'll wait a few more minutes just in case anyone comes.
Right, should we start? So hello everybody, thank you for coming. Um, today we will be presenting um, regarding our managing a worldwide master cloud based on regional multi-market, multi-language portals in Drupal 9. All right. Your speakers are, on one hand, Jose Luis Pellido, our lead Drupal developer, and then there's me, Enno, I'm the director for solution architecture at Cocomore. We both work at Cocomore. Cocomore is a digital agency uh, originally based in Germany, but now with offices all over Europe. We have in our time done more than 50 successful Drupal projects. We currently have 10 client plan platforms for which we are responsible for maintenance. And as an agency, we have more than 15 ye years of Drupal expertise. Right. By the way, if I'm too loud or not loud enough, you just let me know and I'll get closer to the microphone, right? Then, for this presentation, our client, who gave us permission to name them, Nestle Professional. Nestle Professional, they're responsible for selling Nestle products to business customers all over the world. So for example, if you're managing a hospital, a university, or an office space, um, you might need to uh, want to get to them for a coffee machine or food ingredients for your commercial kitchen, right? And then they are the place to sell you everything that you need for your um, business environment. They have the very difficult task to present on their website and sell a very diverse variety of products. That c and that could be anything, so literally from a Kit Kat to a very expensive, complex coffee machine. Hmm. Nestle Professional, they operate all over the world, so it doesn't even make sense to color the countries here because they're everywhere, right? But um, it's, they don't always um, basically act independently in each country. Some regions are grouped together as regional markets. So to give you an idea, I've put here the flags where they uh, operate all over the world. Each flag represents a market portal that um, has been set up in the past in Drupal 7 and that we are now responsible to migrating to Drupal 9. For some of the regions, let's say for example South America, you will, save, you will see very few flags, that's because um, they actually all work together. So the flag on the left, that's LATAM, based in Chile, but responsible for all of South and Central America. Um, similar situation for South Africa, who is responsible for various different countries and uh, Southern Europe. Now, the situation of the project. We started the whole thing end of 2020, when Nestle Professional came to us and asked for our help to migrate their old Drupal 7 platforms to Drupal 9. So in 2021, we did with them together, first of all, of course, analysis and planning. Um, the, we represented a design to them that would make sense for the situa situation. Everything needed to be component-based and completely flexible. And then we did, of course, the functional and technical requirements. Then in mid-21, we started uh, to create the master code, and as a prototype market, the USA were chosen. Um, we therefore started then doing content migration for them in the second half of 2021, and were able to go live as planned at the start of December. Theoretically, it was that you already have a finished project, and all you need to do is the rollouts which was the plan for 2022. When I say all that is left, it's actually quite a lot of work because the rollout, we are not talking about a simple technical rollout. So what we're actually having to do is deployment of the master code, which is then more or less the easy part. But then of course we do need to do content migration from all the old portals to the new one. We need to do local adaptions wherever needed. And a lot of markets had custom integration that they had developed on their own and that also needed to be migrated to the new environment, right? So on paper, this looks pretty easy. We divided everything into five waves, assigned markets to each wave, gradually rolled it up to do more and more markets, and that was the plan. However, if when we then calculated what that actually means in days and what could be done when, Turns out you need to work highly parallel to actually make it all work. So between preparation, the actual content migration, 
Um, and anything technical that we need to do each market, several weeks go by. And if you want to do more, more than 30 markets that consists of more than 50 countries, um, it's getting really, really tight. All right. So we needed a plan for that. And this is what I will be talking about here in the presentation today. Four key areas where we had different learnings and conclusions. So I'll be talking here about planning, design, development, and content migration. Let's start with planning. Our key learning here was adapt and attack your challenges as they arise. Right? Because we did have a grand plan at the beginning of 2022 right? that was, let's add all the roadmap features that we planned for and add them basically for the go life of each wave. Then there might be the occasional market feature request that we can do as well. Of course, we need to develop the third party integrations. And then, of course, there might be bug fixes and additional SEO requests. Right? The year started, we started wave one and reality kicks in, right? We're doing the first two markets and turns out they're having a lot more requests than anticipated. And we did take them on because our theory was, right, what they're actually requesting, it makes sense. Nobody saw it before, but now that we know, every other market that comes later, they will benefit from whatever it's requested. So let's make sure to get them in. And there was a tendency that then continued. We came to wave two, similar situation. We now got to bigger markets and they had different requests, more complex. Um, so whenever it makes sense and it was a global solution that would benefit everyone, we again put it in. And on top of that, we got additional SEO requests. And of course, we needed to fix our bugs, everything that we found on the way. Wave three came. Wave three was the first one where we did more complex market that consisted of multi-markets grouped together with different languages. And that was quite the complexity to overcome. Jose will later be talking about that a little bit more in detail. And right now, at this state of the year, we are in wave four, right? And wave four has some of uh, the big markets that needed specific integration that, uh, because actually they have a lot of content that is not created in Drupal, but rather imported from different platforms. So conclusion for planning was, um, it turned out very different from what we had planned on, uh, at the beginning of the year, but it did help that we adapt and reacted to the market requests, making sure that we got the change requests in in time. Because we do have a sensible situation where if you wait for long, there's always a danger that you will never get it in again because there are too many markets that are already live content would need to be adjusted and there's just no time to actually do that. Second area, design. So early in planning, I talked about a lot of things that we had to adapt this year to make that work. Design is actually an area where we had learned from earlier projects and made sure to set up things in a certain way so that we wouldn't get in trouble uh, or because of how we did things. I'll give sp uh, different examples for that. So first thing is, you absolutely need to make sure that your design process is uh, connected to your development needs specifically for Drupal. What that means is everything that you put in your design tool, in this case Figma, for example, it needs to have a clear purpose, right? It needs to be absolutely clear how it works, how it behaves. If something is a simple Drupal paragraph, you might get away with uh, only the design in Figma and maybe a few sentences of explanation, but in a lot of situations, you actually need a real functional requirement doc and you need to tell your developer your expectations of how this model is supposed to work. Um, one thing that we did in Cocomo is on major project, we introduced the role of solution architect that would actually be someone in the middle between designer, developer, and uh, then of course the client as well. So here's one example, you're having an article content type, um, but not everything that you see in Figma is part of that content type, right? So a lot of the things that you show are actually individual components. And you need to make sure that you communicate that to your developer accordingly. So there might be simple component like, let's say, a text component, a video component, and uh, in your team you have it figure out pretty quickly how you want to do things and how you make sure they have a solution that can grow with the client's requirements. But then there might be either component 
Um, in this case, the last one that I marked red, for example, a multiple column container. How do you do that? What is the approach that is most flexible but does not get overboard when it comes to budget, right? So this is one example where we had more detailed discussions of how we would to do that. Jose came back to me and said, you know, I have certain ideas how to do that and it's more flexible than what the client initially requested. And uh, he came up with a great solution that we then finally did. Second example, the way that we set up the, uh, the design in Figma in the first place. Figma is one of the tools that gives you an endless canvas. But just because it has that ability doesn't mean you should use it. Um, we tried to use Figma in a way that was, specific, uh, was specifically helpful to Drupal. Because on one hand, you need to do the designs for the pages. And typically, those need to be best case examples. Because a client wants to see how beautiful the pages will look like in the future, right? So you put optimized content there. Text that has exactly the number of lines that, that it looks good between the pictures and all the other media that you put there. However, then you have very different needs in the same design tool for your developers. So what we did, I'm not sure how well you can see it. Um, on the left side in the menu, we have a section specifically for components. And they are not set up with optimized content. They are set up, they are shown for edge cases. How much text can I actually fit in a certain component, right? How does it behave when there's too much of it? How does it look on uh, either very big or very small screens? So we made sure we had those two different areas and uh, uh, we always had it clear how something would behave. And together between those two, uh, it worked out very well. Next examples. Very clear rules for behavior and design variations. So Nestle Professional is kind of an umbrella brand because Nestle consists of a lot of brands and all of those brands they want to have to say they want to have a say when it comes to the presentation of their products and the brand itself. So what the brands demanded is for their brand pages they actually wanted to have their own color variations that should represent the colors of the brand. Uh, what you're seeing here on the screen is an example of Garden Gourmet, right? Our challenge was how do you express that in a way that you can cover the needs of all brands, tell them clearly what they are allowed to do, and on the other hand, making sure that you have instructions for your developer then what uh, should be done later. So we came up with a thing of, um, that's it's basically a mini style guide. So we have a generic concept of variables that need to be defined for each brand to represent their own colors, and all we have in there is literally com everything complete that needs to be changed for a brand to be adapted. The code will be encapsulated later, so at any point in time I can add new brands without affecting on any of the existing sites. Keeping with the topic of brands, but uh, something different, how do you tackle change requests, especially in design, right? The brands relatively quickly, but after our initial code development figured out they weren't actually happy if their brand colors were only applied to the brand corner pages, they would please like to have their colors on a lot of different content types, recipes, products, articles, anything that might be relevant to them. So what we did is we had to come up with a roadmap of how to gradually adapt to their needs making sure none of the live portals would be negatively affected in the meantime and it would never ever create any problems for the portals that are already live. So what you can see here is basically four steps to get from a very simple solution where you only have a branded brand page to a situation where we uh, come to um, various different content types which uh, that are then branded which was a brand request and then the markets came and said, oh, actually what, you, what we need on top of that is if you have a normal neutral page, we do need to be able to set that as, so, uh, um, a simple section in brand colors, but only for that one component, right? So we integrated that as well. And plans for the future are actually to allow for completely custom designs when they want, for example, to run a special campaign but still make sure we're running it all on the same components so backend never needs to be touched. 
Next area, development. And I will pass on to my colleague, Jose, who can explain a lot better than I. <laughs> as a technical I will leader. try at, at least. OK, so let's d dive in a little bit more on the technical aspects of the project. So um, can, you, can you please? Yeah, thank you. So um, I, will, I would like to cover uh, four uh, aspects for, from my side were the key for, the, for this project. So, the, uh, so let's talk, talk about first about the project architecture of it. So um, we had clear at the beginning of the project that we wanted to, um, to make sure that all the markets receive the benefits from the requests from other markets, right? So if one market from Germany had a, spe a, specific, a specific request, we can easily apply to all others. But at the same time, we have the handicap of each of the sites are independent from one to another. So at the end, what we did is a distribution, right? Um, but it is, it is not as simple as, uh, as, as it sounds. Let's see why. So the roots of everything is Drupal core plus contribute modules, contribute themes. Um, in an usual project with Drupal, uh, plus your uh, custom modules, you would finish with that. But um, our client, Nestle, created a, a distribution named Linest, which is uh, great because uh, you can um, standard all the, uh, all the approaches for usual user cases. For instance, how do you face, when you create landing pages, how do you do it? Right, with layout builder, with another strategy. So we, you can normalize all the approaches and all the, pro all the projects inside the organization are, are done with the same strategy. But not only that, also security uh, configuration, everything. So at the end, when you have hundreds and hundreds of sites, this is a huge difference for you, having at your own distribution. Then, um, so we, created an addition, uh, uh, we extended the Linus distribution with our own one, uh, Nestle Professional. And this distribution is used to create different, uh, the different sites that we have on live at the end. Good thing is that we are able to, um, to have the same code base for all of them. We are able to manage the releases for each of them, but we don't have all of them in the same server like you had on, on a multi-site or, or whatever. So uh, another good thing about it, and for me it was uh, really, um, uh, yeah, really good, uh, was to, we, we are able to also contribute back, not only to uh, other countries in Nestle Professional, but also to the base distribution, in this case, Linus. So in case that we find any, uh, any functionality that could be really interesting for other markets out of Nestle Professional, they could get the benefits of it. So if you structure your project in this way, uh, you make a difference. Also, of course, to Drupal core and to, to, uh, to the country modules, since we have been do doing for years in Kokomo. Uh, can you? Yeah. Right, so next step, and for me, is the biggest challenge of the project. Um, as we mentioned before, we we have uh, several waves and of the, uh, with different countries, but each country has the, their own specific uh, requirements. So um, one of them is uh, multiple markets on the same Drupal instance, and at the same time having different languages. I think this is uh, one case scenario that I think a lot of people here have faced. So. Um, Let's divide it on, on different scenarios. We have the first single scenario and the easiest one, which is you have your Drupal instance with one market and with, with one single language. Uh, in order to cover that, you only need to, uh, to have enabled config translation and string translation because we are committing all the PO files with the translation for the fixed strings. So when you install the site, the strings, the translation are already in there. Same with configuration. So we have them already in the distribution. So if we instance, for instance, a, si a new site on which uh, uses French, we have already the French translation ready for them. 
it applies only to the new uh, config for new views, everything that we have created specifically for our distribution. Second, we have one single market and multiple languages. Under this scenario, we had to face new challenges. The first one was to um, how, we, uh, how we could make the life easier for content editors when they, their mother tongue is different than the, the language that is used on the, um, on the site. For instance, on in the case of Indonesia, uh, the content editor uh, team uh, was in place on, was localized, localized on, on Indonesia. So for them, it's easier to manage the site in English and then translate to Indonesian. So, um, but we don't want to have English available for anonymous users, for the end user that is visiting us. So that's why we used language access module. With that module, you are able to uh, specify what roles are able to access to what languages, right? And it worked perfectly well for us. Then uh, we had another, another, um, another uh, specific request. Um, how we face it, those custom languages, for instance, if we think about the Latin America uh, regional portal, you have several countries with uh, all of them speak Spanish, yes, but they have a, a localized version of Spanish. So it's 13 words that are different from one to another country. So at the end, you have custom languages. But you don't want to translate over and over for all those custom languages, the whole uh, config translation, the whole config strings or fixed strings. You want to have a tree of languages and then only touch those ones that make sense for you. So for that, we came out with using a language hierarchy. With this module, you are able to specify a tree of languages. And when a user visits your, your site, the system tries to, to fetch the translation of the language that you are seeing at that, on that moment. And if the, it doesn't exist, it tries with the parent language. So in that way, we have neutral Spanish. And then under that, we have the localized versions for Spanish or Argentinian version from Peru, for Venezuela, any. So in that way, you, you only need the, the amount of work that you need to do is really small. And at the same time, you are flexible enough. Let's go to the third and the most complex one. Uh, Multi-market, so you have one Drupal site with multiple markets and multiple languages per market. This is, again, the situation of Latin America. We have our regional portal, South America, and then we have several countries, Peru, Venezuela, uh, Argentina. Then um, you need accessibly control for the content because, for instance, one product could be available on Argentina only but not on Peru or not on Chile. So you need to control what content is available where. And at the same time, you need to provide um, different configuration uh, for each of the, of the markets, for instance. You need to customize your sitemap XML. You need to customize uh, the name of the site, that kind of stuff. So for that, we use extensively the uh, domain module. Probably you may know it. Um, but not only that, because we had another requirement. You need to detect the, um, each of the markets by two, ta two kinds of detection, let's say. One by domain, with the different, each of the markets had their own domain, or by country prefix. So in the URL with the same domain, you had different country prefixes, one for Argentina, one for Peru, etc. So for that, we used a domain country path. With that module, you are, you are able to define each of the domain records with uh, a country uh, prefix, right? And it is put it on, at, the on, at the beginning of the URL, and then the language. Let's face the last part of it. Uh, no, 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 not to it. <laughs> so, uh, um, the last part is uh, languages. Uh, languages, you, you, you have to uh, restrict what language is on what market, because not all the countries speak all the languages. So for that, we used um, language, uh, domain language negotiation. You are able to, with all the languages that you have defined in your site, you can map them to each of the domain records that you have, and also to specify the default language for each of them. Now, 
about the JIT workflow. We followed uh, a slightly different uh, version of JIT flow workflow um, because, as Eno mentioned before, we had different rollouts, different waves, each of them with different f specific uh, features. So we didn't want to, m to mix them, all of them, and we wanted to be able at any time to deploy a new version of the project. So we work on releases. Uh, they start from develop branch, which is the blue line, and each of the big, uh, big, uh, big uh, features are um, linked to one specific uh, release. Uh, tickets on our Jira uh, are also related to each version, so we know at any moment what feature needs to be uh, added to, uh, to what, whatever uh, release. Good thing about this is that, as I said before, you can create new releases and they don't collide with each other. So we can create a new one with bug fixing, for instance, only, and go to live and then uh, apply the update to the already existing and ongoing releases. Now, to finish, uh, let's talk about a, a little bit about the other, other and the whole tool set that we have used. Um, so uh, for us, um, was critical to have a local environment that is the same for every single developer on the team. At the same time, something easier to maintain, easier to, to, um, to run, everything. So uh, we started one year ago, one year and a half using DDEV, and for us it made uh, the total difference for us. Now all the team members, you don't need to know about Docker, about Docker Compose, you, you don't need to know the commands for Docker Compose, you just need to run DDEV start and you have the whole system running on your local. With the same versions that are on live, with everything. So, for us, is a, is a huge point. Same with, um, we wanted to make sure that we are delivering good, good code quality at any time. So instead of uh, running the, the, code, the code checks uh, with PHP stun or whatever, um, on when you run, when you do the pull request, we decided to do it sooner than that, when you commit anything. So with grand PHP, you are able to orchestrate different uh, tool, um, different tools like I said, uh, as I said, PHP stand, or, um, and also you are even to, to um, you are allowed to to specify what commit message partner uh, uh, pattern should be uh, done in your commit messages. So it's great. And to finish um, security, thanks to our IT partners, we were able to use Fortify. So we are scanning our site. Uh, just before we go live, and also we have uh, recurrent uh, scans. But the important thing is that we have two types of uh, security scan, one uh, static with the code only, and other dynamic, on um, which you need a, a live, uh, an existing live site, no live site, no sorry, an existing site to, uh, to, to, to trigger the, the security scan against. So, uh, and also, you can imagine when you have uh, uh, this amount of, uh, of sites, you need to, to deploy them with trust. And for that, we have uh, Azure pipelines, and we are using it extensively. I'm cutting it here because of time reason. If you like, we can talk more about it uh, out of this. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. And with that, we come to our fourth topic, content migration. Content migration, um, it turned out it was a very important topic for Nestle Professional. So you have to imagine there are all these worldwide Drupal 7 portals um, that had been handled individually for different markets by different agencies, adapted over time, um, extended with custom integrations. So you literally had thousands and thousands of pages all over the world that would need to be migrated to the new system. Right? And the question was, how do you actually do that best? There was a SEO agency, the global partner from Nestle Professional, and they made it clear to us, you can't miss a single content. Everything that exists before need to exist in the future system unless the client specifically says, no, they don't want to migrate, and then you need to provide a redirect so nothing ever gets lost. When you're in front of such a big decision, First question is, how do you do that content migration? Two basic ways there. Manual versus automated scripts. 
right? And so we had to make this decision at the beginning of the year and very important criteria to take into account. Content had changed a lot over time. Some markets had integrated their own custom HTML. Content type had actually been diverted from their actual initial intended use to do something different because the system, the old system was so fixed that they had to basically get creative to make uh, new uh, requirements work. And then we had the situation that a lot of markets with a chance of getting to Drupal 9 and now having a component-based system, they wanted to take the chance to actually restructure, update their contents and create new things. All of that combined together was a situation where we say there's no way we can do that with automated scripts and get it right. We would miss too many things. It would need to be adapted for every single market. Uh, let's better do that manually. Turned out, it was a great decision. Um, we found a great content migration team that we worked with that together. Greetings to Maher. And um, they helped us to literally uh, migrate thousands of pages and still do. Right? And there were some positive side effects that came with that. Because it turns out, once you go to the markets and explain to them how you will do the content migration, they have a lot of extra demands of seeing that they actually would have needed to do in the past, never did, but now that there's a chance that we're migrating content, can we please do that on the fly? And they normally said, yes, we can. All right, so on the screen you have four examples of quotes, of requests that uh, were given to us. From our side, there was one strict rule. Um, whatever you want from us, it needs to be expressible as a generic rule that we can follow without having to make an own business decision. If you can't decide on something in a generic way, if you need to decide content by content, then you will have to do that yourself, right? Uh, and with that, we were able to help them a lot of making the content with the migration even better, comply with new rules, and uh, the markets were very happy about that. Now let's talk about how we organized all of that. It was how you actually do a manual uh, uh, migration in Drupal, especially if all your contents are cross-linked between each other, right? So if you're on the product page, you have related recipes, you might have related articles, you have a related brand and any other contents you might think of. So the way we did that is we had at least two phases. For some more complex markets, it would be three. In the first phase, the only thing that we migrate from the old side to the new side are basically empty content containers. So every single page that existed on the old page that was supposed to be migrated would appear on the new side. With that, you have created your URLs and you can cross-link contents to each other. So once we had that, um, we would also set up then, of course, the site structure, the menus, and uh, as well prepare any custom integrations that we would need. Then phase two would start. Content migration team would concentrate on migrating the individual contents, so everything that is inside the container, every single component, all the text, all the media, uh, and the, of course the metadata. And the market in parallel would now start to review the contents that are ready um, at the same time, do the market access and test, making sure that all the standard functionality works with their content. And if they had anything to create on their own site, they could do that as well. We gave them an onboarding of how to do that and the editor started creating their own content. Once you have done all that, um, SEO agency would come in, do an internal audit, making sure that everything is actually SEO optimized. Right? Because um, the assumption was we can't trust the old content. Let's have a run a test over it, making sure that there's, it's, it's nicer than it was before in, in Google's view. And after that, phase three would start. Um, market would then do the SEO optimization and corrections that they had to do. Uh, on our side, this was for us, it was a phase when we do the translations. Um, we do the audit before the translations, so you don't have double work when you need to correct something. Right? So if they find something, you only have to correct it on one on the original language. In the case of a portal like South America, um, you translate to all the other language versions afterwards, so you already do that on optimized content. Um, one more thing I would like to talk about, the positive 
benefits of basically as an agency being responsible for development and content migration and rollouts. It doesn't matter how well you prepare, how many decision makers you involve up front. Planning is always theoretical and there are so many things that are only discovered once the markets actually look at their own content, discover what they actually need and then come with additional requests. The kind of change requests that we got, um, the, the sheer amount and the potential to make the system better, simply because we did content migration for them, they were able to look at the results and say, oh, here are ideas what we actually need. And then whenever we could, we, uh, we did it for them in the time available. That was a huge benefit for the client and it made the system overall so much better. Benefits for us was, we got very happy markets because we uh, complied with our request as much as we could. So these are photos that are actually not forced. That are the markets themselves publishing uh, basically when they go live uh, on LinkedIn. Right. Last but not least, so I have been talking uh, uh, about the focus of the rollouts and everything we did. Of course, if you do such a big project, there are a lot more technical things that you need to take in account and plan from the very start, making sure that your project does not fall over. So let me quickly uh, 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 note them here on this one slide. Worldwide rollout means accessibility, it needs to work everywhere. In some countries like US, you can be sued if your site is not accessible, so make sure that's like a, a basic requirement and should be checked by someone like, for example, your front-end developer or generally accessibility specialist. Have a strategy for optimizing your page load time, especially the media. Make sure the op uh, images are optimized as much automatically as it can be done, helping the editors to not have to do that themselves. Never allow any technical debt to creep up on you. If you're in a situation where requests are coming in but you're already going live with markets, there's at certain point when you have a, a, a certain number of live markets, there's only so much you can still change without negatively affecting all the markets that are already live and do not want to have their system changed, content disappearing or strange side effects, right? So make sure you do everything in time and adjust accordingly. Um, of course, worldwide rollout also means left to right, right to left languages. Make sure you have that in Figma. Um, so you discover things that might uh, look funny when it comes to Hebrew or Arab and, and it's uh, so, so suddenly a right to left layout. Structured metadata today is a must. If you don't do it, your sale agency will basically send you away and you need to start from scratch. Um, also for the editors, if you have a process of separating content creation from structuring the layout, either with a Drupal module or with something customs you did, this is very helpful for them. It makes life so much easier. They don't have to take into account everything at once. And um, another thing that helps uh, the editors is if you take into account the editor workflows. A lot of times, markets might not be able to express very well how they actually work together. They will, however, tell you as soon as they start creating their own contents. So make sure you have things incorporated like uh, revisions and uh, publishing on demand. Uh, making sure that you comply with their requirements. Last but not least, the whole thing at all times, treat it as a living project. Don't see it as something that needs to be abandoned at the moment that something goes live. This is actually when the real work starts. And uh, being able to monitor how it goes, how well it works for them, and then to adjust base, uh, based on their needs, helps a lot to make things better. And with that, we end our presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. We're happy to take any questions that you might have. We have seven minutes for questions. So there are two from the lab. I don't know if you want to read them yourself. Um, okay. So just at the end there, you mentioned separating content from the layout. Do you have any more details about how you did that technically? Like, you mentioned a custom module? Uh, yes. 
So um, nowadays there's actually a Drupal module, uh, it's layout paragraphs, right, Jesus? There's a Drupal module, what's it called? Layout paragraphs, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Uh, making sure, um, at the time that we started, it wasn't far enough to actually uh, incorporate already. So uh, we did have a custom module that we developed together with a partner agency that pretty much does the same job. Thank you, that's interesting. Are you using any multi-site, uh, multi-domain approach? I guess it's for Jose. Could you repeat, please? Are you using any multi-site or multi-domain approach? Um, uh, we'll have every market his own uh, Drupal uh, container. Yeah, I each of the markets, uh, they are independent from one to another. So they are, we are not doing a multi-site. Um, what we did is to have a distribution which is the one we use when we instance the new market, that we, the new region that we want to deliver. Um, and then if that market has, that region has multiple, multiple markets, we use domain to, to, different, to difference each other. But each of them are independent. Each of the regions that we are, for instance, Latin America is one Drupal project, uh, Drupal project, not Drupal instance, created from the this distribution. And then we have, for instance, I don't know, a friend, uh, France or Spain, they are independent from one to another. There was no need for shared content? No, only on those, uh, shared content is only needed for those uh, regions uh, that has uh, multiple markets. For instance, uh, Latin America, they are sharing content. For instance, the same product it can be found on Argentina or Chile. Uh, but um, they don't share products between the French version and the Latin America version. They are de independent sites. Maybe let me add to that, um, because it's a really interesting situation at Nestle. Um, theoretically, there would be a need for shared content, but in the past, the market were working really autonomously, and they never did that. Uh, Nestle is right now thinking about techniques to make more shared content possible and to in integrate it in their structure. And when we have said, we will need to think about multi-site then. Hi, um, a question about paragraphs and translations. Uh, sounds like you, of course, have all of these countries and all this uh, complication. Of, uh, in our experience, one thing which is always a bit tricky with paragraphs and translations, it's been discussed a long time, right, is that um, unless you had some patches, normally you're not able to have, um, well, the field that contains these paragraphs cannot be set as translated. And in our experience, this has been quite tricky. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you faced this issue and if you went the dangerous way of the, part, the patch or if you figured out something better. Yeah, uh, we did. Um, we didn't apply the patch, to be honest, um, because our decision is a little bit different. Like, we were lucky. Um, there were only a few uh, examples where uh, they had different paragraphs from one translation to another. We are lucky on that. But um, we have a few, a few examples where they, they, they are different. So um, since it is exactly for those ex scenarios where we have multiple markets. So we have independent nodes from one to another. And they are linked. So we are not applying that, that patch. But I know what you are, what you are suffering. Thank you for a nice presentation. Um, I have a question around uh, uh, the domain module and country path and language. Um, is there time to show it maybe? I would really like to see like how you do this in different South American countries, you know, changing language and having localized, localized versions. All right, I, I'm not ready, but I, what I can tell you is basically the functionality is when you create the domain record, you can define it in, the, in, the, in that form that you have Defi no, I meant on the front end, like we use it ourselves. I would just like to see like how it's in action, you know, how it is. Uh, well, we can, oh. show you, we can show you afterward, but I'm not really here to. Okay, all right, <laughs> I will come by then, thank you. Uh, quick question, did you have any instance in China? And if yes, what was the process uh, and technical challenges over there? 
sorry, could you repeat, please? Yeah. Do we have any instances? In China. In China? Yeah. Uh, no. China was intentionally left out. So we were told they will be doing their own thing. Legally, it's a nightmare. It's very problematic. So we didn't do China. Um, sometimes you have markets with conflicting interests or, or with different um, perspectives. How do you manage that those markets are happy and how, how do you decide on the releases you, 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 on the features you're going to, to release? That's a very good question. Um, as you might have seen on the world map, most, for example, most of the markets in Europe, um, they have their own portals because they couldn't align on a common approach, right? They are all uh, um, far enough to say, we have our own vision of what we need, how we should do that. We want to use your, your, your base components and everything, but we decide how we put everything together on what we focus and do that. And then you're left only with uh, regional portals where you have more markets, typically uh, with, with, with less money and they have to work together. So they align because uh, there's no other choice. If they want to do their own thing, they need to be their own portal. Clear. There, are, there are a couple of questions in the app uh, from Lev and Nikki. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing. Well, I don't know if you want to read your question. Yeah. <laughs> Just a quick question about maybe the development part. Uh, you said you choose DDDev, DDev instead of Lando. Why? Just did you have some comparison? Um, because before we used uh, DDev, we were using Docker Compose with our own list of. So for us, it was uh, easier. Um, we knew DDev from uh, other previous experience. So, uh, so we decided to adapt it because for us, it was easier to learn. I I didn't I didn't uh, check Lando or anything just because for us it ever worked and we knew it already. So. Try it for sure. Yeah. And, uh, there are another question. Uh, what it was? I already. Ah, did you try groups? Did you have a look into the groups model? Which model? You sorry? Groups. Groups. Yeah. So if we consider groups instead of the main actors for. Um, no, um, because mostly because um, the domain thing, so the detection of of each of the markets, uh, it was harder to do it on on groups. Last thing, last time that I checked groups, groups, I saw it that it was on development. I didn't check it again, but I knew domain, so uh, for me it wasn't on on the picture using groups. Probably nowadays. Groups have changed a lot, and probably we could have used it. But for me, when we saw the requirements in terms of different markets and all the capabilities that we had to to uh, fulfill, for me it was clear to use uh, domain and the domain ecosystem. All right, and thank you so much for your attention, and have a great day.